So let's run through the overview of this uh, World Bank report on thriving cities in under climate change. Introduction over at least 50 years the view that human activity has spurred the uh, world's warming has been supported by scientific evidence the weight of which is now beyond dispute. Globally during this time the number of people living in cities has almost quadrupled and the earth's surface temperature has climbed by nearly 1.2 degrees C above its pre-industrial levels. This keeps going this year as I'm recording this 2023 is an El Nino year so we are potentially going to cross the 1.5 degree C threshold and then of course come back next year if there is a strong La Nina or otherwise as well. This warming has been associated with an increased frequency of extreme hot, dry and wet events across cities worldwide. Global sea level rise has also increased the risk of flooding for many coastal cities. Of course we can keep saying this but it's very critical to know which city is actually gotten rising sea levels going on and which ones are actually dynamically not facing this issue which ones have cyclones coming up more often and adding to the rising sea level and which ones don't so specificity matters but in the overall sense of developing adaptation options we can consider these in a general sense of coastal, coastal cities becoming more vulnerable to sea level rise. Okay, How green, how resilient and how inclusive are cities today as this report was written? So all, I mean it's not that far back in time so it's still valid. To, stay, to take stock of how green, how resilient and how inclusive cities are today, this report defines a global typology of more than 10,000 cities measuring a city's greenness, resilience and inclusiveness using a variety of indicators. So as I said before, when you call things green, resilient or inclusive, you need indicators to evaluate and, make and also monitor progress. Based on the analysis of this typology and indicators are more generally, as well as on the report's other global analysis, 10 key findings emerge. Okay, so we'll come back and look at those. Uh, I don't know why I misplaced them. So let's finish the boxes and then run through the key findings. Okay, defining a global typology of cities, which should come before the indicators, so that's okay. This report measures a city's greenness, resilience and inclusiveness using a variety of indicators. For greenness, these indicators include absolute and per capita production based fossil fuel carbon dioxide emissions, emissions and concentrations of particulate matter 2.5 microns or less, so PM 2.5, and measures of a city's level and extent of greenery or vegetation. For resilience, they include estimates of the size of imp uh, impacts of weather events on a city's aggregate level of economic activity. Indicators of inclusiveness include levels of access to basic services such as improved sanitation and safety, safely managed drinking water poverty rates and levels of in, intra-city household income inequality. Okay, so the footnote here is in addition to these indicators, the report also discusses a range of other dimensions of the greenness, resilience and inclusiveness of cities and how these dimensions relate to climate change, which we will look at maybe a little bit later. I'm trying to be brief, but still try to include as many important things as possible based on my own judgments. Although cities vary widely on these indicators, some general patterns are nevertheless evident with many related to both a city's population size and its level of development. These patterns allow definition of a global typology that is distinguishes that sorry, a global typology that distinguishes between nine types of cities, small, medium and large cities in low and lower middle, upper middle and high income countries. So that combination gives you uh, nine typologies and the relative severity of the greenness, resilience and inclusiveness challenges they face. Chapter 2 offers a full discussion of this typology and the relative severity of challenges that different types of cities face. So having typologies of cities you can also monitor how new cities or growing urban areas are fitting into these typologies, whether you need a new typology to emerge and so on. And then you can create boxes of uh, indicators that fit these typologies and then, you know, prioritizing 
actions for increasing resilience, greenness and inclusiveness also can be uh, made by typologies. Okay. So sorry this figure is a little bit fuzzy here but you get the sense you have country income level here uh, going down so you have high income upper middle income and low income and lower middle income here and you have city size going from small medium and large so you have high income uh, large cities and you have um, middle in sorry uh, small medium and large uh, cities most of the way across in upper upper middle income uh, typology and you have embedded in them low income lower middle income cities uh, with small medium and large sizes so you can imagine cities like Mexico City or well, whatever Beijing Mumbai they all fit into different categories of income level and size here so Europe is almost all full of uh, small medium and large cities with high income and India is full of low income and lower middle income cities in small medium and large sizes china is upper middle income uh, a lot of them but also there are many that are uh, you know uh, lower middle income and so on and so forth so it gives you a good sense of how typologies are distributed poor countries global south stand up e emerging economies stand out uh, rich countries stand out and so on and so forth okay Key findings, maybe we won't finish all 10 in one podcast, but let's get started. Key finding one, cities in high and upper, level, uh, upper middle income countries are the least green globally in terms of CO2 emissions, whereas cities in lower income countries barely contribute to global emissions. So this dichotomy between rich living well and emitting most continues even in when you consider cities. So this is figure 0.1 overview 1. Cities in high and upper middle income countries emit the most CO2 and contribute the most to global urban CO2 emissions. So average CO2 emissions per capita and share of global CO2 emissions generated in cities by country income group 2015. So residential and transportation, these are the, the keys all sources so restricted example here average CO2 emissions per capita tons per year per person high income here upper middle income uh, ranges and can be higher than high income but this depends on many things on the kind of transportation the kind of greenery and uh, various biomass use etc maybe and so on okay lower middle income remain low on the uh, per capita emission and low income cities urban areas remain very low compared to the uh, high income and upper middle income uh, cities or even compared to low middle income cities okay share of global total percent of co2 emissions generated in cities high income contribute a lot upper middle uh, contribute sometimes more than high income countries uh, again it depends you can have huge cities that are uh, upper middle income because of employment opportunities or in China it's kind of planned unplanned so the government tries to control who can live in the city and yet for various economic reasons it allows them to grow like Beijing has grown uh, you know it's massive in terms of how big it is but population wise there are other cities which are much bigger than uh, Beijing in China so lower middle income is somewhere down here at 15 percent or so in a range that is very small and low income countries are essentially almost uh, not contributing to the uh, global total emissions uh, compare you know just from urban areas uh, let's look at one more before uh, we'll look at this figure before we move to key finding two global greenhouse gas emissions will remain above the level required to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees C if low and lower middle income countries continue to follow their current policies so stated uh, policies do not meet the requirements from for 1.5 degrees C target but this is almost a guarantee anyway that will cross this and also just to say as a digression these are not scientifically derived targets 2 degrees C and 1.5 degrees C they are handed to scientists from some other uh, you know origins and scientists are trying to accommodate them in terms of sustain pathways that can keep us below these which probably is not going to work anyways 
Historical and projected aggregate greenhouse gas emissions trajectories under different scenarios by country income group for 1990 to 2050. So you have historical period out to 2020 when the report was written and then future periods out to 2050. And there are various ways to do future projections. Uh, you can use the scenario based futures from the IPCC reports which were the representative concentration pathways in the uh, AR5 assessment report 5. Strong breeze there. Let me close the window. Sorry about that. Uh, no, maybe it's okay. All right. So quickly to wrap up, historical and projected greenhouse gas trajectories out to 2050, so future projections involved here. Uh, so high income, upper middle income and lower middle income and low income. So you can see if all countries transition to net zero by 2050 as required for the 1.5 degree C, greenhouse gas emissions in million ton CO2 equivalents in thousands of uh, million tons, so basically billion uh, gigatons just make sure. CO2 equivalent is when we convert non-CO2 greenhouse gases like methane and N2O2 CO2 baseline. So everybody is contributing with hi high contributions as we saw before coming from high income and upper middle income countries with lower amounts coming from lower middle and low income countries. They all have to begin to drop by projections out to 2050 with the richest one dropping a lot. The poor ones will be allowed to go longer, but they also have to come down and similarly for upper middle income. And if low and lower middle income countries continue with the current policies while the rest, uh, the rest transition to net zero. So you can see the rich countries and the lower middle income, up, sorry, upper middle income countries transition. So emissions reach 4.2 times the level required for the 1.5 degree C. There are uncertainty these uncertainties in these because you are assuming technologies to draw down carbon, bioenergy and carbon capture, for example, transportation transitions, uh, people's policies, governance, and so on and so forth. So scenario uncertainties are there plus carbon cycle itself has a lot of uncertainties. You assume energy consumptions and other things to produce emission trajectories which have to be converted to concentrations and timelines so it's a mess but nonetheless this gives you an idea of how uh, the future will look if we allow lower middle income and low income countries to continue to grow because they haven't been historically the big contributors. So is it fair to force them to also reduce emissions where whereas historically they haven't been responsible. So inclusiveness has to also include global inclusiveness in terms of, you know, um, shared but unequal responsibilities. So that everybody shares the burden in reducing emissions, but people who haven't contributed allow are allowed to continue to grow, develop, be sustainable, and uh, somehow help to make sure that their environmental footprint doesn't become disastrous uh, altogether. Okay, so let's leave this here and we'll come back and go through the other key findings uh, from this report on thriving cities under climate change. Okay.